you can't put blame on uh, victims or survivors of any kind of abuse, right? But I think our industry is rife for um, making that fertile for that to happen. And, and if if we as casting directors, coaches, actors, platforms, we need to eradicate desperation because without desperation, people don't do things that don't feel right. Because what, what's happened if somebody's like physically abusing you, verbally abusing you, being inappropriate, and you and you know, and it's obvious, it's not your, you're not you're not misunderstanding. We should be able to say, be empowered enough to go, that's not okay, right? But what happens is people then go, oh, I don't want to be, I don't want to lose the job. I don't want to be put on a bad list. I don't want to, and that's all coming from that desperation because you know what, I'm, I'm happy to lose a job standing up for what I believe in, right? That's the truth. There's a, a director who's now deceased, you know, and he had a very bad reputation for being inappropriate to women. And I was in a bar in Hollywood where this guy was being very inappropriate to my girlfriend at the time, my friend's girlfriend. And I, I went over and we, uh, we had a chat with him about it and asked him to leave them alone, you know? And he, I don't know if he just assumed, he, he was like, oh, you guys actors? And I was like, yeah, what's, and what? And he's like, well, you should know I'm a director and I could, you know, he, he gave that classic line, I could, I could make or break you in this town. And I was like, well, I don't really care. And this discussion went on to where, where he said, you're one of a million actors here, you know. You should be careful about what you say. And I said, you're one of a million directors and I really don't care. And, and, and truth, truth be told, it's the ego. He, he made a couple of known films, but only a couple. Um, and then it cut to a couple of weeks later, I see this guy and he comes over to me and it's like, I like the way you stood up to me the other week. Who's your agent? So why does that matter? He's like, well, I'm doing this film with another person that since had a lot of <laughs> controversy. And yeah, I think you'd be really good for a role. And I say, like, I don't want to work with you. I simply don't. And he's like, oh, it'd be a bit. And I said, like, I'm not interested. And I think, and that, that came from a, a point of non-desperation. I didn't need, well, firstly, I didn't believe it was genuine. But secondly, I was like, this is not, this doesn't gel with me. And I think if we can eradicate desperation in all forms, we make better decisions in terms of things like that, but also in just better creative decisions. We don't take jobs that don't vibe with our personal morals. We don't take jobs that we don't think are gonna advance our careers in the right way. We just, we're just more empowered without desperation. The idea started about uh, in late 2013. I had a, a friend, you might, you might know her, um, her name's Jessica Rose. She, she's a very hardworking actress, you know, she had a good agent, she had great credits. So sometimes those auditions would come in for the next day while she was still at her work shift. So she'd be getting home late at night and then have no choice. Her roommates would be in bed, everyone would be asleep and she'd have to work on this audition. But luckily for her, she was um, from, from New Zealand. So her mum would get on Skype and read lines with her in the middle of the night. And um, one day she asked me if I would help her run some lines. And uh, I was actually on set myself doing a show called Two Broke Girls. And I just had my script changed on me in a heartbeat. And I said, look, I don't, I'm in my dressing room, but I don't have time to do this because I'm trying to learn some lines of myself. So she wanted to read with me like for, through FaceTime or video chat. Um, and I was just like, look, I would, I would need someone to, to read with me right now because I'm struggling to learn this script they've just dumped on me that I've got to go and perform in 30 minutes in front of a live audience. Um, and, you know, uh, Jess sent me a little idea, like a survey late, uh, 10 minutes later about, you know, what if we, what if there was a community of people that are always available? Um, and so sort of the initial thing was, you know, maybe amongst our friends, we just decide we put this group together that we can just say, look, someone, someone answer. And I'd previously built a, a web platform for uh, promotional and field marketing called Stuck for Staff, which is the kind of job a lot of out of work actors do in between their jobs, you know, handing out free products at exhibitions. And we built this uh, international marketplace in five countries of over a hundred thousand staff that do this kind of work to connect them with their employers at late notice 
it was all about if somebody drops out because you know you've hired this actor or model to do this brand job for you and then they get an acting job they're gonna you know there was a lot of absenteeism in that industry and so you need to replace them in a heartbeat and i just thought that marketplace model would work really well with self-tape readers so jess and i sat down to to figure out how that would look um and we started it as, as a company called we rehearse and the whole premise was literally that you would have a, a a community of people that said yeah i'll help you read through video chat so you could hire them in an instant to to be your partner with the right skills so if i need a, a man or a woman or i need someone with a certain accent or i can find the right reader not just a person um, and then we brought in our third co-founder who is my partner richard um, who's in england and then we launched the company 2015 um, just one-on-one -on -one rehearsals and then uh, about a year and a half later, we held an audition on it for a friend of ours who does a monologue competition and it worked really well. So we thought, okay, maybe there's a way to audition talent as well. And so we pivoted into We Audition. And so now the two sides of that uh, business, one provides uh, readers for self tapes so the actor can be a reader for someone else or they can hire a reader. And the other side is an audition system for casting directors to do video chat castings, which currently now is all the rage. <laughs> England is, is very much rooted in the, the creative arts, right? And which is, which is great. It's all about your artistic talent and pursuit and whatever. But as a business person, and I was back then too, I always was interested in the business side of it. I was like, yes, your product is creative, but there's all this other stuff. And I think sometimes in England, we were encouraged or taught to just, you know, as long as I've got talent, then the rest will just figure itself out. And I'm like, no, actually there's things that we can do to market ourselves or to, to you know, create business relationships within this. It's not, it's not all, a, oh, I'll just do my acting and it, I'll let other people handle all the rest. Um, I think it's important to, to really want to do the side business, right? So that I, I, the criticism I get from people um, is that, well, is the acting not going well if you're running a business? And I'm like, no, it's going fine. Or like, you know, you, I mean, you know me from LA, I was in the scene, I was doing, doing work, and at the same time you can run your business. Now, I think there's some things you can't do that. If you have a, a full-time job with demands, then yeah, you, if you're missing your auditions because of your, your job, then yeah, that is a, that is, you know, going to upset the balance of that stuff. But if you're able to still do your your side business and you're passionate about it, and that's, I think that's the key thing is that when I wake up and I, I work on We Audition or I worked on my previous businesses, or, you know, I also had an organization in, in LA called Brits in LA, which was like a social group um, with thousands of members. It was because I really enjoyed doing that and, and it had a purpose and it had a mission, right? It wasn't, um, it wasn't tough to, knuckle down and do that stuff. But I do remain completely in control of my schedule. And I think that's really important for an actor is whatever you're doing, you've got to see, is it something that you can put the work into and work hard, but still keep your schedule completely at, at your, um, you know, beck and call? Because the acting business that we know is, is a lot of last minute. It's a lot of, you know, the amount of times I've, I've got a phone call to fly to another state or another country within 12 hours is, it's more normal than not. It's that, you know, people say, do you get a lot of it, um, notice? And I'm like, often no. I mean, it's more, it's more often, or I'll get like three days notice and then they'll suddenly change me to the next day. So it's like, you've got to be prepared to just pick up and do your thing. And the thing I love about running internet businesses is as long as I have my laptop, I, I'm working on the plane or in my trailer or whatever. So it, it really doesn't matter if you can organize yourself in that way. Um, I actually wrote for We Audition, I wrote a, a comprehensive self tape checklist the other day for our members, which is like a 30 point checklist. And that's basically, you know, what I go through each time. So, you know, uh, it, it's some of it seems very obvious and some of it people can skip over, you know, like things like reading the brief thoroughly, reading the lines, 
then reading the full script, then going and watching an episode of the TV show that the that, that it is, or if it's not out yet, then watching something else the director's done. I, I research everybody, that's, all the key sort of people that are involved in, uh, in the production, you know, showrunners, producers, directors, because sometimes it gives me some clues about tone or about, you know, the type of actors they like or dislike it, or they, they you know, I just think you get a sort of sense of, of what's going on. Um, then, I, then I do my actor work. I always run lines with someone else. I'm someone that, that I learn lines from reading them out loud with someone else. Is that I don't have a, I'll, I'll do my sort of repetition exercises, you know, in terms of looking at the script and, and putting it in, but I only really learn it when I start reading it with someone, which is, you know, why, why I love re-audition because I, I use it myself all the time. You know, I will get an audition and I will do that, that background work and then I'll jump straight on and, and do a cold read with somebody online. And then I'll go away and do some more character work on there on my own. Then I'll come back and read with someone else and maybe get some tips or advice, go away, do some more work, and then come back to film my final tape. There's a bunch of people in the room and someone at the back is seemingly more interested in their notepad and their, their phone. I don't, th I don't think actors should ignore that. That's gonna happen on set. Right? There's a lot of people doing a lot of things that aren't, it, it's, and I think that's where the actor ego gets in the way. Is oh, you, all of you in the room, you should be watching what I'm doing. Well, no, there's the, the right person's watching it, or maybe they're watching it on the camera, or maybe they're watching it, you know, maybe someone's watching it remotely or whatever. And it might not be necessary for every person in the room to pay you the full attention, right? Because it, at the end of the day, if you understand filmmaking, there's a lot to do. There's pre-production going on. There's all these things that they have to multitask, right? And it's not, that's not, they're not deliberately being offensive to you. I think as you work more and you, you do this more, you understand that it's actually, it's actually really hard to get into an audition room. <clears throat> and so for someone that was, you know, auditioning multiple times a week, I would reframe that like, look, I've been invited into this room and lots of people haven't. And when you see stuff from a filmmaking or casting perspective, if you've ever been on the other side of the camera, which I have as a producer and director, you don't have endless time to see a ton of people. You're not, I, I tell, say this to actors, if you're in that room, no one's sitting there trying to figure out a way to fill up that time. <laughs> you guys as casting directors aren't sitting there going, hmm, I, I'm really bored today. Let's just see another 50 people, right? So anyone that you've picked to come in that room has been picked. It's gone through a process. So obviously you have a reason of why you want to see that, that actor. And, in, and I always think of it as the wild card. You might be the wild card. And I, I've been the wild card several times where I know that I'm not the same as everyone else in there for whatever reason, you know? and I've booked the job. You know, I, I'll come out of an audition, I'll assess if I could have done something differently or better or things I need to improve on for the next time, and then I let it go, right? Because there's no, the, aside from figuring out what I can improve or what I did, I, I don't mean wrong, but you know, like if, look, if I turned up late to an audition, I could give myself a talking to after that and be like, right, what can I do to improve that? Well, research parking ahead of time or whatever. But aside from that um, debriefing that I do for myself after each audition, then I let it go. I don't sit and worry about, you know, could I have done this better or that better? Or I want, you know, a lot of actors, they're always like, oh, I wonder if they've cast a year. I wonder if, I'm like, you would know because if it was you, you would get the call. You know, the sort of actor that checks in with their agent saying, hey, did you hear anything yet? Um, yeah, actually, do you know what Spielberg called and he wanted you to, to do the job and he sent you your plane tickets and I, I forgot to tell you, sorry. I mean, that's not going to happen. You'll know. You'll know if you've got the job or the callback or whatever. So uh, just let it go and then focus on your other thing until the next audition. That was one of those <clears throat> commercials where we were brought in in a group of like six lads. And they gave us all the same action and they just moved the camera along us. So it's like a group audition. We weren't interacting with each other. There was a hero role, but they were just bringing us in groups of six. And I remember distinctly the, uh, the action was, you know, you've, you've drank this drink and you've got a stomach ache, right? So it, it ha it's made your belly ache. 
And so they, they start the first guy and he's giving it all the stuff and they're like talking him through it. And, you know, he probably does like a minute, a minute and a half of like bellyache acting. And then they move it on to the next guy. This guy does like a minute, a minute and a half. They move it on to me. I, I take a swig of my drink, I'm like, oh, and they go, okay, great, next. Great. Well, I get like, these guys get a minute and a half. I remember being so deflated. It's my second audition. I was like, I mean, you can't be more, um, obvious than next within it was probably 10 seconds it felt like three seconds but i booked that job and actually what it was with this they'd seen enough when i first got to la we're given a list of five or six coaches by our agent they're all like 200 dollars an hour and i <clears throat> honestly i remember going to some coaches and being really frustrated because I'd, I'd turn up to their big Beverly Hills mansion. <clears throat> it would take me five minutes to drive up the driveway. And there, there's one coach in particular that spent a good 10, 15 minutes of the session showing me around his house. And I just thought, I, don't, I, don't, I, I get it. You're, you're trying to show me how amazing and popular you are because you've amassed this wealth. Whereas all I'm thinking is my clock's ticking down. It's just cost me $50 to get a tour of your house for you to tell me how amazing you are. The nice thing about We Audition is it democratizes coaching and reading, right? So people can get what they want when they need it, it's instant. And what I love about it, some people charge a fee, some people just read for tips, right? And um, people seem to be very generous uh, with their payments. So even the people that have said they'll read for free plus tips are actually getting a, a very respectable amount of money back in from doing that because I think it really helps people out. People are willing to pay for what's helpful to them. Acting is an expensive career. I've been fortunate enough to always earn money as an actor, right? So I've never been too bitter about paying for this subscription or that, you know, the actor's access or spotlights or the IMDb's. It's like, I see those as tools of my career. But then when you look at the amount of expense that goes out with coaches and, and subscriptions and headshots and stuff, Basically, most actors, the large majority of actors are paying out more money than they're making. And the rest of us, uh, you know, earning money and paying out a proportionate amount. But that as an ecosystem is a bit icky. It's, it's, it's like the masses are paying a high price for products like casting websites that they don't get the benefit from in the same way that the, the people that are working regularly do, you know. If you're, if you're auditioning five, six times a week and you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, you don't begrudge paying 150 bucks a year for a subscription. But then you've got a bunch of people also doing that that are making zero. <clears throat> and so with We Audition, we said, look, set your own fee. If you want to, because as an actor, if I read a scene, that's really helpful to me in a, in a workout way anyway, right? I should always be cold reading. So if I can help someone else out, I'm working on my own skills in one sense and I'm making a little bit of money, great. Um, if I'm a qualified coach or I'm a very experienced actor that's got 10 TV shows under my belt, sure, then I don't, I don't have time to just do it for free, so I'll set a fee. And what we're finding is people are using it in the correct way is that if I just need to run my lines, I work with another actor. When I need to film that self-tape or I want some quality coaching, I can find someone that charges a fee that's got the experience that I need. When I first came up to Vancouver um, at the start of the year, because I'm, I'm in Canada right now, um, I flew in um, and got an audition self-tape whilst I was on the plane for my agent. And I was able to check into my hotel room, set up my laptop. It was for, um, I believe it was for NCIS, and it's to play a you know, detective. And I managed to do my, uh, and the role was opposite a female detective. And the person I managed to get on We Audition was someone who had played a female detective in NCIS. So not only were they a perfect scene partner for me, but they were also able to give me like tips and nuances about the, the way that set works and the pacing and all these little tiny, tiny, you know, um, I'm not gonna say they're, they're, they're not unimportant, but they're small, there's these little nuances that elevate that audition and, and helps me get involved in it better. The whole industry of websites and resources for, for actors 
has been for so long subscription models locking you in forcing you to do stuff you know you, so one of the things we ch we decided to change on this because we're access self right we like we're not going to charge anyone to access an audition if you if you get asked to audition through our platform it is free you don't need a membership you don't even need a profile you can log in as a guest right and we've built that and that that's difficult for us to build it requires a whole different databasing or whatever but we are adamant that we're like if a casting director wants to see an actor and they they want to see the actor on our platform you should not have to pay like many of the other sites to just be given that job opportunity right if you want to use the features to to get better and improve and you know actually utilize the stuff we've we've done sure because that's your choice you go i i proactively want to use these things then you should pay for it right but not if you're reactive reacting to an audition opportunity that your agent has asked you to do it was at an audition room in um in Warner Brothers Studios. So you know it's one of those kind of like porter cabin things that they have those like and you know, all the actors were walking past. You could see see them walking into the room in the in the out the window. It was a tiny one of those tiny little wooden kind of hut things, you know, uh where the walls were thin. And it was one of those auditions where literally everybody kind of looked like me or was like dressed like me because it's very specific look and feel. And just sitting in this waiting room full of people, and I, I'm hearing everyone's audition, which I hate. I remember walking out because I was like, I don't want to hear how you're doing it. I just don't want to hear how you're doing it. I'd rather just I've got my thing. So, um, and then obviously when I go in, I'm, I'm aware that everyone else can hear me. And so I did the scene, and Julia was like, um. Do it again, but you know, and gave me some notes. And the notes would generally go a bit bigger. And we have a lot of sitcom in Britain, but it's not live, it's it's not done really in the same way that often, you know, the big live audience. Um and multi-camera sitcoms just different. It's, it, and I I was I remember reading the notes, and one of the notes was he must be able to react believably when his friend dies of a drug overdose. So I took that believably, literally, and I was doing my best acting of, whereas, you know, I, and this is a, it's a good point, is that even though I'd watched the show, I took that note too literally and didn't, didn't see that note in the broad spectrum of the show, right? And see the energy that it still needed. So I was probably doing my best drama acting to be believable when really I need to be believable in the, in the context of that show. Um, but Julie was like, you know, okay, let's go again and try this and let's go again and try this. And I think I probably did it that 13 times. It got to the point where I was just like, I'm obviously not getting it. And I just, I remember clearly in my head, just going, just throwing the towel. Just, I'm just going to be ridiculous now because I just want this, this horrible experience to end and walk out. So I went ridiculous with it. I was like, because I was frustrated. And as I walked out, um, I called my girlfriend at the time and I was like, you know, I think I'm going to, I'm going to take a little break from the acting. I'm just, I'm just not getting it. I'm just not getting it. Uh, I said, well, wait a second. My agent's calling. Uh, they're, they're probably like, uh, I don't know. They're, they're probably going to drop me. Right truth i literally was like this is them calling to say what the hell did you just do in there like you know what it's not working out d and they're like great news man you're going back in tomorrow for a call back with michael patrick king oh one note go bigger <laughs> and i was like i don't know how much bigger i can go <laughs> I, I just you know and so and obviously i went back in for the call back and i booked the job and that's the job i was on when we created we audition